Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Philip Arola, and I am the president of the PSU chapter of the College Republicans. A brief reminder that this event is being recorded, so smile for the camera if you decide to disrupt. <laughs> the College Republicans are devoted to promoting conservatism on campus, and one of the cornerstones of conservatism is the free exchange of ideas, which explains the four liberals sitting to my left right now. We welcome people of all political persuasions who are interested in honest debates to attend our meetings. Right now we hold them Thursdays at 4 p.m. Check out our Facebook page for more information. Our, fr our friends at Turning Point USA are also helping us host this event. Turning Point is a libertarian group here on campus that promotes free markets, free speech, and free people. They have meetings twice a week, Wednesdays from 5 p.m. to 6.30 in Smith 262, and Fridays from 2 to 3.30 in Smith 262. For more information, please see the booth outside in the hall, and be sure to send them your emails <clears throat> and name by signing the little placards they have. So now on to our panelists. Christina Hoff Summers is a resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute. Before joining AEI, she was a professor of philosophy at Clark University where she specialized in moral theory. Her articles have appeared in publications such as the Journal of Philosophy, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the New Republic, Slate, the Daily Beast, and the Atlantic. She is also the editor of Vice and Virtue in Everyday Life, a leading college ethics textbook, and the author of Who Stole Feminism and the War Against Boys, the latter of which was a New York Times Notable Book of the Year for 2000. She is the co-author of One Nation Under Therapy. <clears throat> Her book, Freedom Feminism, was published in June 2013, and a revised and new edition of The War Against Boys came out in 2014. She has lectured and taken part in debates on more than 100 college campuses, and she hosts a weekly blog, The Factual Feminist, which has attracted more than 400, no, just 4 million views. You can follow her on Twitter at C.H. Somers. <laughs> Brett Weinstein is an evolutionary biologist who works on questions of complexity. He is currently focused on exploring the adaptive relationships between genes and culture. He taught for 14 years at the Evergreen State College in Olympia, Washington. Please give Brett a round of applause. <laughs> Professor Heather E. Haying was an evolutionary biologist. What? Okay. Uh, I messed that up, didn't I? Uh, Oh, lucky me. Okay. Well, she was an evolutionary biologist at Evergreen State College for 15 years. She recently resigned in the wake of campus-wide protests last year. I, I didn't hear about that. You're going to have to tell me after about that. Her work on the sex lives of poison frogs in Madagascar earned the highest dissertation honor awarded by the University of Michigan. Please give her a round of applause. And finally, PSU's own Dr. Peter Bogosian. He is a full-time faculty member in the Department of Philosophy. He's an international speaker for the Richard Dawkins Foundation for Science and Reason and the Center for Inquiry, and has an extensive publication record across multiple domains of thought. He's the author of A Manual for Creating Atheists and the creator of the Atheos app. Please give our panel one last round of applause. Welcome. It's wonderful to see so many friendly faces and to see such a civilized group. Uh, tonight, I'm gonna we're going to talk about questions of diversity, victimhood, college cultures, academic freedom. I've distilled these into some basic ideas or concepts that will run throughout the discussion. Here's the first theme or concept that I'll throw out, and then I'll ask the panel to discuss. At what point are you not looking after someone's best interests by indulging their victimhood? So we indulge people's victimhood all the time. We indulge their victimhood on college campuses in particular. 
I'll, I'll throw that, that question out to you, Brett. Uh, this is on, good. Um, that's an incredibly important question, especially in the context of education. But I want to start with a little bit of biology first. Human beings are the species with the longest developmental period of any animal. And there's a reason for that. A long developmental period is not a good thing in and of itself, but it allows for uh, creatures to be more plastic than they would otherwise be. So it is no accident that the creature that has dominated every terrestrial habitat on Earth is also the one with the longest developmental period. But the upshot is that what happens during development matters a great deal. The payoff is in adulthood. So the danger, if we infantilize people, if we indulge victimhood and don't train or teach people how to be resilient and how to get past these obstacles is that as adults they won't have the tools to do that either and that's where this is really going to come back to haunt us. So I, I would suggest that one way to look at this is to think about the connection between uh, trauma and extraordinary capacity. Very frequently we'll find out if we discover that somebody has extraordinary capacity it will turn out that there's some sort of traumatic event that is... What do you, I mean, interrupt, what do you mean by extraordinary capacity? What do you mean? If somebody... Well... Okay, well, you can... We're going to get there. We're going to get there. Um, so extraordinary capacity uh, is more or less as you would expect it to be. Somebody who has demonstrated a capability to go beyond what others have done. Somebody who has innovated in some way that most people could not. And what I'm arguing is that very frequently the ability to do something extraordinary is coupled to a traumatic event, which you could read as meaning that trauma is good, but it isn't. What happens is people are um, damaged, and then some small fraction of those who are damaged find their way past, and they go from being uh, wounded to scarring over. And so what I would argue is that we do not have a civilization that is well structured for us. It makes us all unhealthy and unfit for the environments that we have to succeed in. That ill health is uh, best dealt with if we can scar over and figure out how to deal effectively in the world as we find it. So we should be, especially to the extent that trauma and, and that these wounds are real, our top priority ought to be dealing with those wounds so they can scar over and we can empower the people who have them rather than keeping them uh, perpetually hobbled. And, and you mentioned resilience, I'm going to get back to it. So I'll just use as a placeholder, we can revise, we can change this later on if we don't like it, but uh, rather, rather than pull from the peer-reviewed literature, I, I think that a common dictionary definition of victim is in order. The first Definition is a person harmed, injured, or killed as a result of a crime, accident, or other event of action. And in most cases, in this context, we'll be talking about or other event of action. We can unpack that if we want, but that's a good placeholder. Did you want to, Heather, did you want to jump in? Yeah, I think that's a good, um, good segue. None of us are denying that victims exist. Crimes exist. People will, uh, will commit crimes, and therefore victims will exist. But the culture hood that empowers victims for the sake of being victims keeps wounds alive, keeps wounds open. And so what, uh, what all of us have seen, and I suspect that everyone in the audience has seen as well, is a kind of activism that I've begun to call read-only, like a hard drive that, can only, uh, that you can only read that you can't write to, where people aren't taking in input, and it means that you can't discuss anything with what this looks like then, to pick up on this physical analogy that, uh, that Fred is using, is people are keeping their wounds open for the sake of having wounds to point to, as opposed to having wounds and trying to heal, and then, sure, still being able to point to the scars, the event, whatever it was, and saying, this thing happened, either to me individually or to me and my lineage, whatever it was, and I still expect to have that be honored. But I'm healing, and I'm working towards a better future. So that is the dis distinction between this culture of victimhood that all of us have been observing and um, saying, I'm a victim, I, something bad happened to me or mine, and I'm trying to move forward. Christina, did you want to add on? I'm going to add one. Is this on? It doesn't see. Oh, yes, it is. 
I saw some very interesting, uh, when I, I was doing a new edition of my book on boys, the, the war on boys, and you constantly heard that uh, boys are not in touch with their feelings, and uh, women talk a lot more about themselves and their, so uh, a researcher, Amanda Rose, I think she was at the University of Missouri, she and her team studied um, a, a, huge, a large number of adolescents several thousand, gave them questionnaires to ask them, how do you feel when you talk about your problems? Do you feel better or worse? Well, it turned out that there was a gender difference. On average, the girls said that when they felt upset, they felt better when they talked it over with a friend. And uh, they, they got a lot out of it. And a surprising number of the boys said that it was weird, and a waste of time. And then the researchers looked at people's sort of mental health, and they found there was a lot more depression among the young women. And instead of the usual conclusion that we should all dwell on our problems and how we've suffered and talk about it and share it, they actually thought that there was some just adaptive value to stoicism, and that the young women might be a little better off if they were not, didn't engage so much in rumination. And uh, now, they said there are going to be young men that have problems and have to talk about it, but they, then they had, they said you probably should approach him as a problem solver. You know, don't just say, dear, can we talk about this? Because he's going to go, oh God, you know, I know my sons would do that. So my point is, that I think that as a culture, we're inclined to think that dwelling and ruminating and talking and, and sort of uh, wallowing in our pain is going to cure us and it's there it's quite likely that it could do harm and I think if you go through something cognitive analysis cognitive therapy which is one of the best regarded forms of therapy sort of short term you learn how not to you know go dwell on your self and, and constantly sort of uh, pull yourself down and to be resilient. And they build up your, res it builds up your resiliency. So I just think we should be careful, even the whole psychology that, that um, is implied by this, this victim approach. Heather, did you want to jump in? And then I want to jump in about her secular blasphemy that you, she just committed. Okay. Um, so I'm actually I'm rereading War on Boys now. I read it when it came out, and it's it's fabulous for those of you who haven't. Um, one of the things I'm reminded of in the reread, um, in the new edition, is uh, your point about the loss of physical activity in schools yes. in recesses, right? And um, it's correlative. We can't point to clear causation, but there there are a lot of correlations um, that, that you can you can point to. Um, that make it look causal with regard to uh, boys in particular being unable to um, <clears throat> to move around, to explore through physical play, through sport, uh, and to basically move forward through what might, might be minor insults or major trauma and everything in between uh, is potentially aggravating the culture of victimhood. Yeah, and we do see higher rates of anxiety among adolescents, especially young women. And I think it's also a problem for them. There's more sedentary behavior, less recess. You know, kids are cooped up. And all of this, it just, this, this focus on, overly focus, uh, too much focus on emotion and, uh, you know, emotional expre expressiveness, you can go too far with that. Yeah, so help me understand something. So I have been fascinated by this idea that the secular blasphemy, there are many secular blasphemies. Blasphemy isn't just a religious thing. The, the secular blasphemy of today, or one of them, is that there are biological differences between the sexes, and that there are, um, and that even saying such a thing. Yeah, I said it today at the law school. I spoke yeah, at so Lewis and Clark, and people went crazy. People went, oh my God. You know. People went, and you suggested at the Moore event that women, on average, are. Shorter than men, and people went berserk. I mean, as if this was some kind <laughs> just, of like description. Just to be fair, it was it was scripted, right? Um, so yes, the response is is remarkable. But in the in the case of the Demore event, it was a timed walkout, and it happened to be perfect for YouTube. 
right? Um, okay, they walked out in, when she said, in terms dared to say that men are on average taller than women. But I think oh. it's actually, I think that makes it worse. I think that that points to a deeper problem, which again is this, we're not even being heard. We aren't even allowed to engage in dialogue uh, about the most obvious things, I mean, much that, less that, really that, complex, nuanced ideas that will um, offend some people and some people will disagree with. Well, so, Those yeah, are exactly the ideas that yeah, we Yeah, and we just can't about. give in to that. I mean, so what if they're offended? I could possibly care less if people are offended. It depends why someone's offended. I mean, if somebody is offended because you've criticized an immutable characteristic that they possess, then you ought not to have done that, and that's a no-go. Skin, color, height, something like that. But you do not have a right to not be offended, specifically when your ideas come into play. And now that we have all of this morally fashionable nonsense about, oh, you know, biological differences and such, and I understand that people want to discharge these moral impulses because they feel very strongly about trans issues. Like, I get that. But that doesn't give you a license to de deny biology. That doesn't give you a license to deny reality. Um, Brett. Yeah, can I... Uh, synthesize several things that have come up that are really aspects Please. of the same thing. So there is, we have all experienced a kind of what seems like an insane deafness to transparently obvious realities. And it's very bewildering to hear people denying things that are just simply factual and could be tested in this room if we wanted to bother. Uh, but this also reflects uh, the failure of, as Heather was pointing out, the lack of outdoor play, for example. The thing about play outdoor is it teaches you when you're confused. If you're confused, then you fall rather than make the leap that you think you're going to make. And so you end up with pain, which then gets uh, pondered, and you realize that there's something in error in your thought process. And so by eliminating this kind of outdoor play, what we do is we decide that all reality is abstract, and that all reality being abstract, it's very easy to go down some road where wouldn't it be nice if we could say males and females are the same, therefore anything that turns out uneven is the result of some broken process that we should then seek to fix. The problem is that doesn't map to reality. And the, I think what is actually taking place, and it is surprisingly postmodern, is that there is this sort of abandonment of obligation to reality itself, almost as if the people who are engaged in it don't believe that reality is a thing. And I would just submit to you that it is uh, much more likely that that idea will take hold in an era where so much is done online where you don't end up with a skinned knee because you were confused. Yeah, Hello. so prediction. People who spend a lot of time hiking or playing sports or doing anything with their hands where they've created something and at the end of the day, you know, they've got a chair that functions or they're on the floor, are less likely to buy into the idea that reality is a social construct. If you are engaging with the physical world, you know that there's a reality out there that abides by what you do or doesn't. Whereas if you're mostly engaging with the social world, it's much easier to delude yourself into imagining that maybe reality is a construct, because social reality is. I, I just want to take a, a moment to say, isn't Portland State awesome? Like, we have no lunatics running around here freaking out. <laughs> Nobody's pulling out the speaker wires or anything. We're all having a civil conversation, and if you want to have a civil conversation, Portland State is the place to go. So thank you, everyone. All right, so the second, kind of the corollary question that I had was, what potential negative effects come, and you've touched on this a little bit, what potential negative effects come from indulging victimhood? And that's exactly what I think it is. I think that we are indulging victim narratives. I think that we are creating a culture that raises the victim up. So what negative effects do you think come from that? Uh, Can I, I'll just start by sure, saying, Christina. I. I've, I have been watching, um, you know, sort of feminist theory for many years, and in, in 1992, I was working on an article for the Atlantic about women's studies, and I went to the National Women's Studies Association, um, and the first day we were there, they were already being pressured by uh, some intersectional advocates in the group who said they were marginalizing 
too many groups. So the first day, at the National Women's Studies Association, we were told to break down into groups according to our grievances and healing needs. And so there was a group for lesbian women, African American women, Asian women, Asian women, fat women, Jewish women. None of these groups proved stable uh, because they, there were no men there to oppress us, so we started oppressing one another. And <laughs> So the lesbian group broke down into a black and white faction. The black lesbian group was not stable because some of them had white lovers. That was thought to have given them privilege, so they had to have their own group. Or one woman said, I had to flee that group for my own safety. And the Jewish women, some of them uh, wanted to celebrate their Judaism. Others wanted to recover from it. They started to fight. <laughs> and then new groups emerged, a group of women with allergies demanded that the, that the Na National Women's Studies Association acknowledge their, their many, many pa their pain and not wear dry, we had to sign that we wouldn't wear dry, clean clothing or perfume at next events. Uh, maybe they had that, a point that about I, that. That I, did, did, but, they, but I'll just, to finish, it, it, it was a victimology spinning out of control. We did, we ended up, well, actually, my, I, my sister went with me, um, and we ended up bonding with some radical lesbian separatists, not because we agreed with them, but because they smoked, and we needed a cigarette. <laughs> but anyway, uh, it, it was tribalistic. And it, just psychologically, I think, you know, Psych 101, you'd learn this is not a way to accomplish anything. It's not a way to get anywhere. This was in 1992. Now, you would think those professors would have gone back to their campuses and think, well, maybe this, we should, have, we should come up with another theory. No, they went back and uh, have been teaching it since yeah, to it, their students. Yeah, Kimberly, that's Kimberly Crenshaw's intersectionality. We well, can, I don't, it, what we she can, had in mind was, it was a little different. This is, but it was an application of a, uh, a certain interpretation. It was an interpretation of intersectionality that I, I think Crenshaw might not agree with. So that's an example of indulging victimhood. And even, even bringing that up is kind of bordering on some kind of a heresy. Can you think of either examples or negative effects of indulging victimhood, Brett? So there, there are two points that uh, I think are, are worth making. One is that you create learned helplessness. I mean, just it's obvious that you will create learned helplessness, that if the way that you have gotten your needs taken care of is by highlighting your status as a victim rather than figuring out what you can contribute, then that will be the way that you seek to do it as an adult. The other thing, though, which I think is harder to spot, is that for exactly the reasons that Christina is pointing to, these coalitions are completely unstable for reasons that trace themselves to very simple game theory. They cannot be other than unstable. So they will come apart in the end. What will happen, though, is that we will miss the real opportunity to solve the problems that are the motivation for these movements. So, explain, explain that. So if uh, I get asked a lot now why, what it is that makes me a liberal, I keep claiming that I am one, and then people on both the left and the right claim that I'm not one, and so the question is, well, by what standard do you imagine that you are? The standard I would put is that uh, progressives like me believe strongly that a fair world is essential. Not perfectly fair, there will always be bad luck, but a basically fair world is essential to all of the other values that we would want to establish. If we want to attain that fair world, the right way to do it is not to deny biology. That is, in fact, um, a, that is a recipe for failure. If you want to deal with the unsettled issues in the sexual landscape or the racial landscape, confronting the biology is the way to go about it. And if there's one message that comes from having studied evolutionary theory in depth for decades now, it is that there is no boogeyman hiding there. There is lots of stuff. It's not the least bit politically correct. In fact, it is very frequently politically incorrect. But there is no obstacle that I'm aware of in that landscape that would prevent us from creating a basically fair world. And what I'm watching is us having a very foolish conversation about whether males and females are different, when, in fact, what we should be talking about is which of those differences are immutable, which of those differences are amenable to us renegotiating what there is, and what kind of world would we like? 
Uh, I personally favor one in which everybody has freedom to choose as much as possible what roles they want to play. So that, that does not involve going back to some old view of males and females. That, in, that involves going forward, but doing so in light of the biology is the way to do it stably. Doing it denying the biology will crumble sooner rather than later. It's inherently unstable to deny the biology. Heather, did you want to jump in on that? So I, I, it is interesting, and I, I don't want to ride this hobby horse too much, but it seems to me that there's one single source where bio, only in theology and gender studies do you have rampant biology denialism. And it, it seems to me that all of the disciplines that have been infected by postmodernism are subject to this in some way. And if you haven't seen it, I'd suggest that you might lose a couple of IQ points from watching, but if you haven't seen it, <clears throat> Excuse me, watch uh, Jordan Peterson's debate with gender sc studies scholar Nicholas Matek. It is an absolutely fascinating uh, example of someone who's completely disconnected from reality at the most fundamental level. <clears throat> and how this person is allowed to teach in our institutions, I think, is really the fundamental question. Again, I don't want to ride this hobby horse too much, but I think that th these folks have created their own journals. They've, they've literally manufactured their own body of knowledge, of scholarship, and they publish in these, and then they credential themselves. But what are you talking about? You're just talking you, about people in the abstract fashion. What are you talking about? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, so, well, I'll, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you what. See, Peter, can I say something? Uh, uh, well, I, I just told you, but I'm not going to indulge you anymore. If you want, you can talk during the Q&A, but I just literally just, I, well, no, this is a conversation. You're, you're in the Q&A. You're not in the conversation. You're trying to be in the conversation. Well, uh, the, my final word to you is I literally just said Nicholas Mate's debate with Jordan Peterson. And you, then you asked me who, and I just told you. Heather. I, I was going to say, actually, in response to you, um, that one thing that we've been hearing a lot of is this problem is overblown. You're making it up. It isn't as bad as you say, right? And it is. The journals are real. The departments are real. And it's not mostly the students, I will say. For one thing, Students are in college in order to learn, in order to be taught, in order to be educated, not in order to be indoctrinated. And so it shouldn't be a surprise to us when bad faith faculty take them under their wing and tell them to be victims and they say, I'll try that on, sure. I'll try that on for three months, six months, see how it fits. And if it's empowering in the moment, then it is going to stick. So. There has been a proliferation of departments in academia in the last 10, 20, 30 years. Pretty much any department that ends in studies, <laughs> plus, plus a number of established disciplines, such as sociology and geography and cultural anthropology, have all have, been infected. Have been infected. infected. Have been infected, and they're basically taken over. Yeah. And the way to look at this, I, my own opinion, you, you have to look at this as a religious movement. You have to look at this as, instead of the faith virus, this is the intersectionality virus, and it's literally twisting people's minds and becoming institutionalized. But Christina, did you want to? Yes. Um, if you look at gender studies, and I've been ordering textbooks, the new textbooks coming through, and it's uh, taken for granted that gender is a social construction. They will sometimes admit that there might be, you know, a tiny bit of biology involved, but that's, you know, negligible compared to the impact of culture. Now, I don't disagree that it's a, uh, I think any sensible person would think it was a, a mix of biology and culture. We don't quite understand. We, we have yet to fully understand. Uh, but when you, it really makes a difference because what I find in these textbooks, if they look at a problem, if they look at something like the wage gap, or they look at uh, gender differences in college majors or in, in professions. And it's surprising, after several decades of feminism, we still have you know, men and women, on average, major in quite different things. 
and you see a disproportionate number of males in engineering and economics and uh, computer science, and women overwhelmingly uh, dominate in psychology, sociology, probably uh, foreign languages. And uh, to me, as someone who uh, is not fixated on a single explanation, I don't necessarily attribute, say, the wage gap to discrimination or implicit bias or hostile environment or this sort of thing. It's possible that in the pursuit of happiness, men and women, on average, take somewhat different paths. Blasphemy. <laughs> and uh, just in case anyone uh, is going to say, uh, someone will say, well, I'm a female and I'm with a, you know, for example, you will make more money if you major in petroleum engineering than early childhood education or feminist dance therapy. So, so <laughs> You'll make more money yeah, in, petroleum so this, in petroleum engineering, and there are far, it's, it's, I forget the latest numbers, but it's majority males. And is this because the women have been, you know, today at, the, uh, at Lewis and Clark Law School, oh, several women were just shocked that they I went, said... They went berserk. They just went berserk when I said that they, that they you know, if, you, if this were 1950 and you said women didn't freely choose... Uh, then I might agree, but it's 2018, and I think women are, who are choosing as they are, they're making different choices than men, and at a certain point, we just have to say, we want equality of opportunity, but that doesn't mean we're going to enforce sameness of result. The results may turn out to be different and in a free reason, society. Is the reason that that is a blasphemy because it violates the zeitgeist, the Ethos it right violates now violates a dogma. The dogma is egalitarianism. Egal if the, I, any disparity, exactly. You know, actually, there's a an exception. Any disparity that favors men in some way has to be discrimination. Disparities mm. that favor women, ah, that's fine. That's just life. You know, they don't interrogate those so much. Uh, you know that you have more women in college. That you have women. You know, just doing so much better at all levels of education. Uh, the, on average, the girls are way ahead of the boys, and you, you find little uh, concern about males when there's that disparity. But, you know, if you find there are more, you know, males ma majoring in engineers than, fem than females, that seems to be... Right, a and many professors then go and they look at their classrooms as an ideology mill where they have the moral answers to questions at the beginning of class. Litmus test. If you're a gender studies major in here, why haven't any of your professors required you to read? And if they have, I'm sorry, immediately on the spot right now, I'll change my mind and I'll say I'm sorry, I'm wrong. Why haven't any of your prof professors invited you to read Moth and Nussbaum's Criticism of Jewish Butler? Well, there you have it. There's your answer. Are there, in fact, Heather. any gender studies majors in here at all? Okay. <laughs> so that wasn't a good test. <laughs> I'm sorry, I was wrong, I made a mistake. So, can, yeah, I, can I point out two places that we should uh, highlight something here? Is this really a problem, or is it being overblown? Because yes, there have been a few cases that have been quite sensational, including the one that Heather and I were involved in, and what you encountered earlier today. And at Oberlin, and at UMass, and at Georgetown, but carry and on. Middlebury, and <laughs> Yale, and all of the, the, the long list. Yes, it's a problem, and it's worse than you think. Uh, the problem is cryptic until it does something dramatic enough to show up on, on YouTube. Heather and I existed in an institution for 15 years in which this was brewing, and only in the last couple of years did it become obvious that it was present. But I also think it's possible to underrate the danger of this based on the idea that it has something to do with college campuses, which is, it is almost incidental that we are seeing this on college campuses. This is a much more widespread problem, and all you have to do is look at the one case that doesn't fit with all the others, which is the Demore case, where Google, Google, which is a frighteningly powerful corporation, effectively omnipresent, in many ways omniscient, um, capable, of, well, think about it. It knows yeah. things about you your spouse doesn't, so it's a very <laughs> dangerous entity. Um, that entity fired somebody for saying very reasonable, standard, accurate things about gender when, in fact, it had asked him 
to respond, and he simply um, thought that they meant it. And so he wrote a memo, and he's now being demonized. The fact that it has reached Google, and that it in fact uh, is resulting in people being fired should spook you. The fact that the NLRB signed on to this. And what's and that NLRB? The uh, National Labor, Labor Relations, Relations Board, Board. Uh, signed on to the idea that, that DeMore's firing was legitimate. So what that tells you is that this belief system is spreading into places where it now can act. The First Amendment doesn't apply to Google. Google is a private entity. And so uh, it will now do all sorts of things that we will maybe never even know about based on its wrong belief about gender. So, so that's one point. The other point I want to make is that uh, you mentioned, is it, is it biology or is it culture? And I want to point out this is where we need to level up our understanding of the biology so we can confront it. Now I know what I'm about to say sounds wrong. I'm still saying it, so that probably means I believe it for some reason beyond the obvious one that it's wrong. Culture is equally biological as genes. It is equally adaptive. So when we say that something is cultural, we have not escaped the idea that it is an evolved property. What culture does mean, the things that are housed in culture rather than in the genes, those things are much more likely to be amenable to our intelligent tinkering. If we want to take something that has passed down the female line and we want to democratize it so males have equal access, if it's a cultural property, that will be much easier than if it's a genetic property. And, and vice versa. So we need to realize culture is not the escape hatch where anything that lives there is, is not evolutionary, um, but it does provide us certain advantages where we want to alter uh, the, the state of, of, our, uh, of our, our civilization. I think it, I'm, I'm, I'm positive actually, is your brother, Eric, who said one of the most, I, I think Twitter's kind of a cesspool, He's, he said one of the most profound things and I think it's a litmus test for an ideologue. And that is, if there is a conflict between facts, and I'm, I'm, I know that I'm not getting this right, so excuse me, excuse me, Eric. Uh, if, if there's a conflict between the facts of biology and if that conflicts with something in gender studies, on which side do you defer? Yeah, it was, if there is a question that impinges on uh, gender differences, who do you trust to adjudicate it? Uh, the right. and biological I, scientists or the gender studies uh, folks. And it was a poll. It was a poll, yeah. and the, the results of the poll were staggering. Now, it's not a scientific poll, obviously, because he's asking a subset that isn't random. But it was a something, Twitter poll. Yeah, it was 98%. And, you know, he did ask that people broadcast it into other filter bubbles, so he tried to... to Get away from I some think of it the may bias. have ended up 95.5, but it was it was something 95% biology, 5% gender studies, maybe as much as 98 too. But the replies to the poll uh, were made it look like the people who were yelling on Twitter, as opposed to voting anonymously, the people who were yelling made it look like you'd be crazy to believe the biologist. So it was it was like 50-50 in the comments, but the poll was like 95 or 98. Uh, to the remainder, depending upon which of those it was. So anyway, the idea is there's something very different that unfolds when you're privately voting and when you are publicly discussing your reasoning. Those two things do not look alike, and that should tell us something. And I would pick up on this, that um, it's an anecdote, but it's a, it's a lot of anecdotes, that in the wake of the madness at Evergreen, I was running interference on Brett's email for a while as emails were coming in at the rate of several hundred a day for weeks. And one thing that we saw, one type of email that we were seeing a lot of were, I'm a 25-year-old, 30-year-old, 40-year-old, 50-year-old, 60-year-old. I'm not in college. I'm in the private sector. Or I'm in government, but I'm a working person. And I got fired. Or I had to keep my mouth shut or else I was going to get fired. Or uh, my friend got fired because I had a different opinion. Because... I dared to think that men and women might be different. I dared to think a conservative thought. I dared to be religious. Right? There are a lot of beliefs that people have now, some of which are scientific, some of which are just true, some of which are religious. Some, you know, there are a lot of beliefs out there, and the intolerance for them is extraordinary. And the number of anecdotal, granted, stories that we have now heard 
from people who are saying, this is happening all over the place and it seems to be emerging from the same place. It sounds scripted. It sounds like it's coming from the same place every time we run into it. I want to I want to throw out something too. I think that in addition to that litmus test, another way to judge the answer to your brother's question is: Does somebody obfuscate when they ask when, when you ask that question? Do they oh this and this? There's never come into this to tell stories. No, like what is the answer to the question? Obfuscation is a litmus test of an ideologue. Okay, so well, it could it could also be introducing nuance. So I'm just nah. no, no, <laughs> never. No, maybe, 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 and and maybe, maybe that, maybe that's what I need to. Uh, obfuscation will never be about nuance, but nuance could look like obfuscation. Yeah, ma wouldn't. maybe that's where I need to be more receptive, uh, and maybe that's where I need to to change my own mind about something because I do feel that exactly what you said. There are these moral orthodoxies. There are these statements that are that are taken as timeless immutable truths and to question them it doesn't just mean you're wrong it means you're a bad person and in the classroom to ask people to think substantively about these things what public policies should govern folks who have IQs under 25 like that we need to talk about that we need to talk about factory farming we need to talk about these questions and not talking about them isn't going to make them go away and then revert, reverting to a victim narrative where someone right, runs out we haven't even gotten to the safe spaces trigger warnings and microaggressions which is on the list too um, I think that's a good segue. I think that's a good segue. So having these discussions, what role should somebody's, and, and again, I realize this is a very complicated question, but what role should one's former life experience play in a classroom setting to either allow them to leave for the moment or leave for the hour or leave for the whole, it would be funny, you take intro to philosophy class, and you say, I'm triggered by the whole thing, I can't go to the semester. Uh, <laughs> But, but at, at what point, when does the, does the complex psychological histories that people, that people bring into the classroom, what point d does uh, having some kind of an escape hatch for those folks come into play? Look, every school should have a, a, some psychological service. So if someone is really in trouble, and as a philosophy professor of many years, it never happened, but if they'd come to me and said, well, we're going to be talking about the ethics of abortion, and I, you know, I can't be here. It never happened, but if it did, then I would have been compassionate about that. But it's now it's almost as if people are encouraged to be hypersensitive. But but here's the important point: is for many years I was teaching philosophy, and there was a sacred commandment: "Thou shalt teach both sides of the argument." So when I taught anything you know, in, in, in personal identity or metaphysics or in good and evil, you know, I would try to find the best philosophers, you know, uh, and, and, you know, I loved it when the students would become totally committed utilitarians. And then they would read Kant and begin to have serious doubts and that just that, it's just a lovely thing that happens in an education. And then one year, uh, the chair of my department asked me to teach feminist theory. And I sent away for the texts, and I don't know what I was thinking. I thought it would be, you know, just intelligent uh, debates around affirmative action and surrogate motherhood or something. And instead, it was warmed over Marxism. All of the texts were mut sort of mutually reinforcing. There were some doctrinal feuds, but way, way over on, on the far, far left. It was assumed that the free market system, capitalism, was the enemy of, the fr of freedom. <laughs> All of these assumptions. And it was very different. These, these courses are very different from a typical philosophy course. And I, I, just the other day, and I think it was Medium, a, a young man had an essay that in his philosophy course, no matter who they're reading, they're reading something by Tom Nagel, you know, one of the most brilliant philosophers alive. And what they do is they get it and they start taking it apart. No matter how, but you take it apart. And he said, that does not happen in these other courses. It's more where you just, you know, go further and further into this belief system. And I just never saw it as my job as a professor to convert the students to my way of thinking. But if you read these articles, and I did a lot of reading from my first book on Who Stole Feminism, about in feminist theory, 
they have a word, you know, for students that challenge them, they call it resistance. And what do you do? Alison Bay's epistemic pushback. Yeah, it's epistemic like a, pushback. It's a Kafka trap, right? It's like someone says you're a racist, and you say, I'm not a racist. Well, they use that as guilt of your, of your racism. I mean, it's right. a, they've constructed these amazing... Conspi they've constructed a conspiracy theory, and if you challenge it, that shows that you're just part of the problem that they're trying to solve. I think that's right. Um, and I would say over in science space, there's an obvious way out of this conundrum as well, which is to simply use the scientific method and to say any idea that you generate, you try to falsify. And you know, there's, that's, that emerges from, from Popper in the 50s and 60s. But you try to falsify your cherished beliefs, not try to confirm them. And philosophers mostly do this. Um, all of us who have taught at the college level, for the most part, have PhDs, doctors in philosophy. We're supposed to be investigating, first and foremost, I think, epistemology, questions of how we make claims of truth. On what basis are we making claims that we believe things to be true? And when I have said that to other faculty, I have often been met with disbelief. That's not what we do. We don't have time for that. <laughs> we and have to what, get to stoichiometry. And, and we, like, no, you really need to start there, or else, or else people won't know how to think. Yeah, and we've lost that. We've lost the looking at the other side. We've lost the sincere being honest with ourselves, looking at the evidence, and look, you know, th there were just facts about reality that make us uncomfortable. But that, that's all the more reason to look at things. And you know, the reason that there are 600 people here or whatever to go to the more, more event is that often people don't feel that they are getting the other side of the story. But this, the academy has to be the place where we have these conversations. Well, but we also have to be honest about why we're not having them. And there are a number of reasons. One is that we've created some, uh, I'm struggling for a euphemism for phony, but phony disciplines that uh, are allowing some bad thought to be cultivated without being challenged. But then there's the other part, which exists in the sciences too, which has to do with the economic byproduct of the overproduction of PhDs. The, the overproduction of PhDs means that every PhD who's trying to get or keep a job is insecure because they're insecure all the way into graduate school. They will have studied very narrowly so that they are one of a tiny number of experts on their subject or maybe ideally the only expert, which means nobody's in a position to challenge them. And this results in not being very good at teaching students how to take an idea that they believe and attempt to falsify it because it isn't primarily what they've been doing. So I would say, uh, we probably need to clean our own house and figure out how the Academy strayed from its mission of truth-seeking and became something else, and we should restore it. Yeah, I want to piggyback off of that. For all the professors in the audience, I want to throw something out that I think is a, an enormous problem. Is publishing in predatory journals and journals with no impact factor, and then using that in the suite of, of the, the, the basket for the tenure, tenure and promotion, and people pro uh, publish in these low-impact factor journals or no-impact factor journals, and they get promotion and tenure out of it. It's an enormous problem. I tried to bring attention to that in the, the hoax paper I did, the conceptual penis, and people went berserk. But it is an enormous problem. We're promoting people to jobs where they teach our children in our most important institutions, our institutions of knowledge production, and these people are, I don't want to say frauds, because that's, that's too serious of a, of a word, and I don't mean frauds, I don't mean fraud certainly in any intentional sense, but they haven't gone through the rigorous qualification, the rigorous process needed so that they can duplicate that. And, and again, couple that with what Christina was saying, what Heather was saying, and we have the problem that people look at the university as their pet project as an ideology mill where they go in knowing the answers to moral questions. And so it is, it should be about epistemology. How do you know that? How can we just confirm that? How can we rip that apart? And, and I think when we've lost that, We've, we don't just damage ourselves, but we damage, to bring it back to what you said, but we damage our resilience. The idea that we can then be more resilient to the idea. If you, only, if you only hear your own side of an issue, you become ever more brittle when you hear another issue. You're not capable of making those arguments, Christine. Yeah, as John Stuart Mill said in On Liberty, if you only know your side of an issue, you know nothing. And Mill thought it wasn't good enough just even to read a synopsis of the other side. He thought it was best to find, a, you know, the person that most ably believes that uh, uh, is a proponent of that. So then, why wouldn't gender studies have tried to get some libertarian feminists? We're out there. 
or some you know conservative feminist or even some anti-feminist. Uh, why wouldn't we have that diversity? And just think how great that could be if if we could have studied gender honestly and with a full range of opinion. But uh, a long time ago, and I have many colleagues who did who were dissidents, people like uh, Wendy Kaminer, Camille Paglia, Katie Royfe, and uh, you were called a backlasher, and you were called, you know, a traitor or an anti-woman, and I was even called a non-woman. Anti-woman. <laughs> anti <-woman. laughs> I was called a non-woman. Someone referred to Christina Hoff Summers and Margaret Thatcher, those two female impersonators. <laughs> Someone said that on Tumblr a few weeks ago and they were called out for transphobia. You're not supposed to say that. I, that was consoling. So I want to, we're definitely going to leave time for the Q&A, but before I do that, I, I really, something that's, we shouldn't ask other people to question their beliefs, evaluate their beliefs, be open to revise their beliefs, unless we're willing to do that. So I, I'm going to put each one of you to the fire right now. I want an example right now <laughs> of a belief, something, that, a position you've advocated this evening. What this is a, a version of, 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 if you take my classes, the defeasibility test. How could that, what evidence could you be provided with that? What, what was the word? Defeasibility? Defeasibility. What yeah, it's it kind of like disconfirmation. It's a fancy word for disconfirmation. It's a philosophy word. It's a $2 word. It's the only big word tonight beside epistemology. Uh, what evidence, of some any position that you've advocated or that you feel strongly about what would it take to change your mind in that position? And, and I would ask you one more thing. I want you to be specific, please. Please tell me something specific you've talked about or has been talked about that you believe. What would someone have to show you to change your mind on that? Heather. I'll go. Um, I, I've referred to this idea that I've begun to talk about with regard to read-only activism. The idea that many of the activists will not take input, and that that is actually far more damning than, uh, than the idea that they have considered the idea that, for instance, men and women are different heights, and they've rejected it flat out. Uh, that's, that's an easier thing to deal with, I think, <clears throat> because it's just batshit crazy, right? Uh, <laughs> whereas, uh, if there's just no, in, if there's, there's no ability to take input, um, at a society-wide level, we have a bigger problem. So. Uh, I would love to be wrong on this front. I would love uh, to find that the activists uh, who are who are disrupting Lewis and Clark earlier today and Evergreen last year and so many other places all the time um, were actually open to input. How would I know that? Um, That's a great question. Yeah, how would you know? You, there's only one way you could know that. Well, I think... Um, they have to start saying things that couldn't also have been scripted from the inside. So there has to be a change in, in the language and in the behavior that appears to be responsive to what is happening. And it may still be in wild disagreement with what I, for instance, believe to be true. Um, but if it is changing in response to uh, what is coming in from the outside, then that's not read only. And that means, then, that we can have a conversation. And if we can have a conversation, then we can move forward. That's great. That was a great answer. So, yeah, that, that deserves some claps. That's a great answer. Yeah, and at, at the core of that answer is the importance of discourse, civil discourse, and dialogue. It seems obvious to me. Yeah, that's right. And I think, um, you know, we're, we're not in dialogue with all of you. Uh, we will be in like partial, quasi-dialogue with the Q&A, uh, but, but we can be in dialogue in classrooms, in college classrooms, and in our daily life, we need to stop what appears to be the epidemic of cowardice. Right? We need to be able to stand up and say, you know what, I don't agree with you. And the fact that you are trying to make me silent by virtue of your position, I'm not going to be silent. 
Right, and we know talk. we know that there are consequences for that. There are consequences for questioning the reigning, reigning moral orthodoxy. You will be called a Nazi. You will be called a racist. You will be called a misogynist. People will go after your family. I mean, we know that there are consequences for these things. But if everybody remains silent, the madness will continue. That's exactly right. All right. Brett, something specific, please. Sure. Uh, so we have talked in a number of places about the question of whether or not unequal outcomes necessarily reflect some kind of bias or unequal treatment. So at Evergreen, there were claims that there was rampant white supremacy, and that was resulting in differential outcomes between people from uh, different racial groups. At Google, there was the, uh, the claim that the low number of female engineers was the result of discrimination somewhere. At Evergreen, we got to see what the story looked like on the inside. There was a mathematical analysis of the outcomes, and if one looked at it, just briefly, it looked like things were terribly unfair, but if you looked at it closely, it was clear that the statistical analysis was in fact a fraud, that it had cherry-picked certain results that uh, highlighted a problem, and it had specifically buried results that said there was no problem, or even results that said Evergreen was extraordinarily good in some ways. So uh, I believe that not all different outcomes reflect a bias. And what would cause me to believe that these biases were rampant at Google or Evergreen or any one of these other places is a carefully designed study that showed in, let's say, a pairwise comparison that people from who are either male and female pairs or uh, from different racial groups arriving with the same qualifications then had different levels of success. If you showed that, that after coming through the door, people who differed only in this one parameter had different uh, levels of success, that would suggest that in fact something quite wrong was taking place in that institution. Whereas, if people arrive with different qualifications and then they're not equal when they graduate, that doesn't tell you anything. So a proper quantitative analysis that controlled for differences that people carry through the door would convince me that these institutions were in fact full of bias that I don't believe they are. Okay, and what, when you say convince, you mean you would change your mind? Absolutely. Okay, I just want to be crystal, crystal clear about that. So both of you now have told me that you're willing to change your mind, and you've told me exactly what it will take to change your mind. Now, something specific. Okay, well, I talked earlier about what I, basically, I saw this movement within feminist circles towards a kind of uh, tribalism and, you know, people breaking apart into, you know, mutually sort of resentful little groups and it seemed very unhappy and it's become censorious and authoritarian and the opposite of what I thought feminism was supposed to be about. I mean, I come as someone who was sort of a flower child in the 1960s, sex, drugs, rock and roll, freedom, um, and I just thought we were going to keep going in that direction. And then, yeah, racism and, and, and transphobia, and, and you know, that's bad, let's say, no. <laughs> and, that, and so people getting together, and if I saw on the campus that there was this sort of, uh, you know, openness, and that there was real integration, and, and, you know, people from all different sorts of people were becoming friends and getting, and, and but what you see, you now it's possible, it's just, you know, a small vocal group, and there's a lot that's very good, and I suspect that there's a lot that's very good, and the, the good sort of freedom and friendship and mutual compassion and all that's going on. But on so many campuses, there's a small core, uh, very vocal, and I'm afraid they're going to move in, out into Google and other places and start changing things. So the answer is, if if this goes away soon and we stop with all these call-outs and there's just the punishment and the censoriousness and people becoming, people banished and a loss of respect for bedrock liberal values. I hear people questioning for free due process and the First Amendment and you know, free expression. So if I began to see that as some of my critics, including members of my own family, my, one of my sons, both of them actually, say you're exaggerating, it's not that bad, 
I, I would be happy to prove wrong, and we will not see what I saw today at Lewis and Clark. I actually kind of thought they might be right, and I'm not going to judge just by that one school. But I, we would stop seeing these, uh, what looks like, you know, uh, kind of an authoritarianism. And we, we see it on the right, but I see it on the campus on the left. It's interesting to me because all three of you said that you would be happy. Some, something to that effect. So I think it's in the Philebus, Socrates says, it is better to be refuted than it is to refute. So you, you have no, and I think this is a, a misconception, you don't have any ax to grind. Like, I don't have any ax to grind. I just want to find out what's true. And I want to be in an academic environment that allows me to ask questions without being a, a blasphemer or a heretic or, right. you know, that guy. And I don't feel we're moving towards those ideals. And if we want to create living spaces outside of ourselves where we can flourish, where we can where we can live the kind of lives that we want to lead, the only way to do that is to make sure that the beliefs that you have are tethered to reality. Once that tether is broken, then you're working hard to create structures outside yourself that are antithetical to your own interests. They're not bringing you closer to your well-being. In many cases, they're bringing you away from it. There's also a conflation of ideas with who you are. So people imagine that if you disagree with something they've said, some people, I think the activists, the authoritarians, imagine that if you say, I disagree with you, what you actually mean is, I don't like you. I, I, I find you distasteful. I don't think you deserve to exist. None of which people mean, in general, when they say, I don't think that's right. Disagreeing with an idea is not disagreeing with a person's right to be or exist or even think that idea, necessarily. Um, you're just disagreeing with an idea, but that conflation is actually something that all children have, and we're supposed to grow out of it, and we're supposed to grow out of it with help from our peers and from the adults in our sphere, which might be teachers or parents or mentors, and somehow the adults are missing. And, and I'll agree that I'm wrong if suddenly comedians are welcome back on campus. Mm. Yeah. Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, so here's what we're going to do now. What we're going to do now is we're going to take a Q&A and a few things about the Q&A, some basic rules in the Q&A. Uh, we're going to line up at the center point. And what we want, the first, the most important thing is that we want to allow as many questions as we possibly can allow. And in order to do that, I'm pleased, no life stories, no, you know, just ask your question, 25 words, whatever, and then we'll just go through the list, and we'll get as many questions as we can. Uh, I would also ask that you please state your name before your question so that we can refer you to you by name, Bob or Sue or what have you. And then what I would ask, oh, hold on, just back off, just a, just a few feet back. Um, we, he, he doesn't no, even no, have a mic important. yet. This is important. We, we want people who disagree with us. I want to repeat that. We want people to come first to give, to give an opportunity to ask your questions first to disagree with us. And the second thing is just due to security concerns, after the Q&A, uh, we're going to walk out and exit. So, uh, uh, so we ask that you please don't, don't mob us at the end. So you just do you disagree with us? Okay. Neutral's well, okay. Neutral's okay, too, I guess. <laughs> And state your name. And if you have somebody, if you want a specific person, could you please state their names? Well, these are general, general okay, questions. What's your name? My name is Kaiser. And what is it again? Kaiser. Kaiser, OK. Um, to what extent do each of you believe socioeconomic inequality subsumes identity politics? And uh, how long will it take for intersectionality to eat its own tail? That's definitely not neutral, but <laughs> Christina. Well, I think it's happened already with the intersectionality. Um, I mean, if you, if you, if people have such complex identities, and if you keep going further and further, uh, you'll end up with the individual. So why don't we start with that? Go back to individualism. So I don't see, this is the big problem with intersectionality, is I don't, as, I don't mean in a, descriptive way of just being aware of people's complex identities. If you're an activist, if you're a lawyer, you're a, a policymaker, you, that, that matters and you have to 
you know, know that, you know, African American boys are falling further behind in school than, you know, Hispanic girls. And I mean, there and there are huge differences between those two. So you need to know that. But as a an organizing principle for a discipline or for politics or for social action, where does it go? So I, I'm just not very hopeful that it leads anywhere. Sooner or later, you have to forget about your identities and look at what you have in common. Further divisiveness is where it goes. It's divisiveness. And then you have to, you, I worry even about the effective activism because there are big problems in this world that need to be addressed. There are problems that feminists need to address. And that means getting together, cooperating with people across identities, across even across political divides. And that's when women made the greatest progress. If you look historically, women made the greatest progress in the 18th century when you had a Mary Wollstonecraft and then you had a more conservative stream and they complemented one another. It, ha it happened when women won the vote. You had, you know, you had the suffragists, but then you also had the National Christians, Christian Temperance Union uh, that organized mainstream women from all social classes and across races. Those two came together. That's when you make progress, when you cooperate with people with whom you disagree, people who don't look like you. So that's, we have to get back to that. We're going to have to get over this, the in intersectional moment. Yeah, do you want to, Brett? Yeah, there were two questions there. I would say the, the one about when intersectionality will eat its own tail, actually, I would argue that game theoretically, intersectionality eats its own tail as spoils are divided. That is the point that you can predict it will come apart. So um, anyway, that can happen within an institution, that can happen more globally, but as it wins and the spoils are divided, kaboom, um, which will be a disaster, I promise. Um, the other issue though, how much is racism subsumed by socioeconomic, I forget how the question was phrased, but basically how much does uh, economic disparity subsume racial disparity? And the answer is look at zip codes zip codes are not fairly divided and much follows from what zip code you're born into. So from that you can get a great deal of this and it explains why we're having part of the conversation that we're having, which is that a lot of us are being accused of racism of which we are not guilty, but zip codes may be guilty of racism and if those zip codes are guilty of racism and we're not addressing it because we're trying to fend off accusations that we are personally racist, that is a recipe for disaster. Heather, did you want to go, or we'll just... All right, so are you disagreeing with us? Uh, neutral, but I think more closer Are you really neutral? neutral? Yes. Like, not like that other guy who was pretending to be neutral? Yes. So all right, go ahead. So I just want to say, Ms. Summers, I've been a huge fan of your uh, series, and I really enjoy it. Uh, so you are not neutral. That, that is neutral. I just neutral. want to get that out of the you, way first. You are not neutral. <laughs> That's fact. Facts yeah. are neutral. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, so my question, it's not too long, but uh, my perception is that we have two big problems. It's uh, streaks of anti-intellectualism and an unhealthy obsession with the underdog. Uh, the most recent that I can think of is a Channel 4 interview with Jordan Peterson, which was not a particularly one-sided debate, and then the immediate follow-up with Vice doing another takedown. Um, so it just seems to me like there's this unhealthy, I have to take this person down even though the sort of intellectual requirements to be able to be in that sort of competition are not there. So is this something that is real that I'm perceiving, or is this, uh, what are your thoughts? If so, if that's real, what's the path forward? Christina? Is, is, you, want well, Christina you, you mean the that? idea that people have to be taken down and so forth? Yeah, yeah I, this is actually for everybody. You know, it seems yeah, almost like a Yeah, I don't like really a, a mind that, fighting. and I, I mean, there, one can say, one can find fault with sometimes Jordan Peterson. What I find is those who just want to write him off and assume that he has some malevolent agenda because he's so popular. And I don't mind, you know, a critical approach, but as you said, there were just uh, hatchet jobs. Yeah. So to be clear, you were talking about the Kathy Newman interview. That one in particular, yes. Okay. But it seems to be like every single one of you has had some sort of hit piece shot at you by someone who really doesn't understand your base subject, and it's pretty disingenuous. But I was wondering what okay, he's what neutral. He is neutral. Um, so, neutral. Or did, did you no, want to no, continue? Uh, I just wanted to point out we are in a novel environment, one for which we are not well prepared. We can't analyze what's taking place. You need to think about the incentives of these entities that are doing the interviewing or writing these hit pieces. And unfortunately, I would argue that 
Markets, though they do many things brilliantly, are incapable of doing certain things well at all. One of them is journalism. And the reason that they can't do journalism well is that in competing for an audience, they end up catering to that audience in order not to drive them away. So what they do is they will tell you what you want to hear rather than what you need to hear. And that's what you're watching. So the question is, how can you either join filter bubbles so that your biases cancel or survey enough filter bubbles that the, uh, the um, net result of what you see is at least somewhat accurate. And we're all in a poor position to do this. Um, but but the, the economics are driving the narrative in a direction that even the people who are participating in it don't necessarily understand. I would just add to that. Um, I think there's a perception out there among some that we're dangerous, and we are. Jordan Peterson is dangerous, and Dave Rubin and Sam Harris and Michael Shermer and Joe Rogan and all of these people are in fact dangerous because they are giving a platform for people to discuss ideas openly. And the open discussion of ideas is dangerous to ideology. It's not dangerous to a free society, it's not dangerous to democracy, but it's dangerous to ideology. All right, another neutral person. Thank you. You're welcome. Are you? Do you? Don't are you? Let him, let him. Okay, I'm not going to police the. Okay, go ahead. You look very seriously against us, so this is good. I just wanted to say thanks first off for coming and speaking today. It was uh, this was a great talk. Um, I'm kind of curious. There was something that wasn't really brought up in your talk, and I'm just curious your thoughts on it, which is about something that I've seen over the last ten years, which is polarity. I mean, there used to be a time where you had an idea. And you'd have like five different people and they'd have five different ideas on it. And now everything is reduced down to either for or against. And it's a, it's a bad movie perhaps in total, but the movie Fountainhead, there's a great scene where in the paper they're deciding what's going to be the next thing that they need to write about. They need to make an issue out of something. And they, they need people to debate. And the people that are in the media that, that drive, like you were saying, the eco economics drive this narrative, they don't... They actually don't care what we yeah, think. Let, they don't. Let, they, let me th piggyback, if I may, please, on that question. You know what, you know what I feel is just a shame? It's not only that we're polarized, it's that we've lost friendships. Like People aren't friends with people who have substantive disagreements. Who cares if someone disagrees with you about something? You know what I mean? Look at this guy's a college Republican. I've never voted Republican in my life. Right? And the, you know, I'm, no, I haven't. I'm an inveterate liberal, and here's the college Republican guy in the suit. You know, so who cares? You know, you can be, my dentist is here. I don't know what he is. My doctor is here. My buddies. I don't know what these people, what difference does it make what someone's political beliefs are? You, you have bonds beyond ideologies and friendships and kindness and compassion and decency. And I think that that, that, that gets lost. And what a shame for everybody. What a shame. Did you? I would say I think there's also a deep irony in the fact that uh, the people who are decrying the idea of, for instance, binaries in biology are exactly the ones enforcing binaries in conversation. And wow, that's awesome. True false. So this has something to do with what Heather just said. I wanted to maybe dichotomize the question of polarization, though, because we have a narrative polarization, which is a total disaster. Right? The, the point is that both of these pure views are going to be wrong. The lack of nuance is really harming us. On the other hand, uh, for those of you trying to figure out what to do personally in this context, I would like to encourage you to rethink polarization uh, of a social group. So I will say, I have lost some friends in what happened to me, but I also discovered that they weren't really good friends. The ones I lost were people who were not going, they're not safe to have as friends because they're not dependable when they are frightened. Um, on the other hand, I've gained a huge number of friends. So I would say the whole episode revealed character in the most amazing way. And so if you find yourself polarizing a room, an institution, or some other social group like that, ask yourself, is it polarized in a way that makes sense? And are the people who are in favor of what you are saying the people you would want on your side if things became very serious? Do you want to add to that or next one? Next one. Okay. Thank you. Hi. What's your name? 
My name's Chris. Um, hey, Chris, thanks for coming. Thank you for hosting the event, or not well, you for hosting the event. Thank you for participating in the event. Um, I want to go back to what you were saying about your, uh, Eric's poll that he had on Twitter, um, where the voting was incongruous with the verbal responses that were given. And it seems to me like that is very indicative of the, the whole environment that is present in academia, is pre it seems to be present in Google, it seems to be present in, present in parts of our government as per the decision made by the National Labor Review Board. And um, it seems like most people aren't part of the totalitarian activist bent, but they're not the people who speak. The people who speak are the ones who are shrill and use bad faith tactics like thought terminating cliches and shame and enforcement of dogma rather than discussion to, to come to conclusions. And I would just like the panel's opinion on where, just maybe just an exposition on, on, on what, why you think that this is occurring and why people don't want to, I mean, actually, I know why people don't want to stand up. Heather and Brett are a perfect example. There's no real, at this point, there's nothing to gain from standing up to this vocal minority. There's only things to, you know, there's no incentive because whether you allow them to continue or truth. speak up. Truth is the incentive. Yes, but if you allow them to continue or if you speak up, it seems like there's, a, there's bad consequences either way. How do we keep the, how do we bring the public discussion up out of the mud um, is, is, I think, my question. Again, back to the game theory. Thank you. The reason that you're seeing that phenomenon is because the narratives that you're seeing deployed are tactical. They are not informing you of necessarily what the people who are saying them believe, or sometimes the people who are saying them believe them, but the people who wrote them don't. They know better, and their private discussions reflect this. The tactic is the weaponization of stigma, right? By stigmatizing you if you step out of line, lots of people who would step out of line decide not to, and so that causes the narrative to look artificially clean, and the whole thing unfolds that way. The natural way to solve this problem. It's not easy game theoretically, but the natural way to do it is to support people who do stand up. If you support people who do stand up so that what they experience is not being, you know, driven off the cliff or into the sea, but they experience an outpouring of support. This is why I was saying what I was about polarization. If you find that you polarize an entity and then, yes, you've got enemies, but you also have a lot of friends, that's a much different experience than being isolated from the herd, which is essentially for evolutionary historical reasons, um, very frightening because it tends to have been fatal for our ancestors. Okay. Hello, what, can you tell us your name, please? Uh, my name is Justice. I'm Justice. here all the way from Eugene. Just wanted to thank you oh, guys cool. for coming out here. Welcome. Uh, my question is primarily, I guess, for Brett and Heather, but anyone can answer it. Um, so with the emergence of, um, let's say, the alt-right and the radical, um, far-right extremist movements, we've also seen uh, an emergence of certain scientific claims made by them, such as uh, disparities in IQ between races, the natural uh, tribalistic tendencies of humans that cannot be overcome, and the sociological effects of diversity. Uh, and for all I know, they may be completely uh, inaccurate in their scientific claims, but I find that these are certain things that are not allowed to be openly discussed. So uh, in part, I'm curious what your thoughts are on these scientific claims, but also, I guess, primarily, do you feel that uh, the ideological suppression of certain things in science and academia actually is enabling to these radical reactionary counter movements? Yes, that's a great question, question, by the way. So. Uh, that's a complex question with like seven landmines in it. <laughs> um, but so let me say, first of all, the, the, the artificial consensus inside science is a problem. The fact that uh, a diversity of viewpoints on what is true with respect to something like the heritability of intelligence between populations, that the lack of a natural diversity of opinion on that is causing um, I believe, artificial support for a point of view 
that is uh, not robust. And I will say, if you want to figure out where the bodies are buried on that question, you need to look into the definition of the word heritable. The definition of the word heritable is very different now than it was when Darwin used it, right? It has changed as a result of our discovery of DNA as a, uh, a mechanism of transmission of information. And you will discover the definition of heritable does not make sense. So even if you were able to support a claim that there are substantial differences in average IQ between two populations and those differences were heritable, it wouldn't mean what you think it means. That sounds to a lay audience like it means there's a blueprint in the DNA and it results in these differences and therefore, you know, let's be adult about it, there's nothing to do about it. And that is not what it means because of the way the term heritable is defined. So I don't want to go into a biology lesson here about the problems with that word and what would have to be done to fix it. But until you've got that straightened out, you can't even address that question properly. We, you know, that's one of those questions that we could really unpack. I, I don't know how, I think it was on the Sam Harris's Waking Up podcast, I heard this, I, I'm not sure, either that, maybe I came up with it myself, I don't know, I read it, I don't know. Who knows? But, but the idea I think is either either floating out there or it's in my own head. So it's somewhere um, that unless we have developed a moral infrastructure to ask these questions, at some point, and you, I'm not an evolutionary biologist by any stretch of the imagination. With the advancement of technologies and Moore's law, we will have ever f you know finer granularity of instrumentation to look at the brain at a level in which we're currently not capable of doing that. And unless we have paved the dialectical highway, if you will, in other words, unless we have a, a moral infrastructure that enables us to wrestle and ask these questions, it's not clear to me how not asking those questions is going to make it go away. So what are we going to do when, when then something, we do invent a technology or something comes up and then we don't, we become brittle again. It's the same thing, a the theme that's emerged throughout the panel. Not talking about something does not make it go away. It just means that an extremist is going to step in with a solution. Yeah, I would say um, there has been a, a trend among scientists for, for scientists to sort of split along lines of all questions should be asked even if the answers are going to be ugly. And some people think, you know what, I suspect so strongly that the answer to this question is going to be ugly and that it is going to cause chaos that we should not even ask the question. Uh, on that split, I am very clearly over, over here. Where, Which um, the over here my, part? My feeling is we have to know. We, we have to know, and as Brett pointed out, we, can't, we don't know yet uh, on the question of, for instance, race. My suspicion, as an evolutionary biologist, my, my deep suspicion uh, for a, a number of evolutionary reasons that we don't have time to get into here is that uh, there won't be heritable differences, um, both because all populations uh, have had to exist and survive in the environments that they've been in. And different environments have required different things of people, but um, if people have survived in an environment, they've had to be smart to do so. And secondarily, there are no pure populations anymore. There's no pure lineages. So the amount of inbreeding and outbreeding between and among populations at this point means that there's not going to be any any ability to track back to what populations must look like. Uh, but that's not, that's not based on any work that's been done. There hasn't been enough work that's been done because it's, it's forbidden. It's, it's forbidden research. Like Charles, the grief Charles Murray has received, right? Well, um, the problem is there is data. My claim is it doesn't mean what we think it means. It doesn't, there isn't enough work, there aren't enough people who have done the work, and the definition, I mean, trust me, heritable? is a serious problem because, for example, if you, uh, let's say that there was a belief that people who had, uh, I don't know, a brow ridge or something uh, were stupid, right? And that belief was widespread and that brow ridge was genetically encoded and it resulted in people going into the world and facing uh, discrimination in school, let's say, because the brow ridge connoted to their teachers that they were not, um, likely to be intelligent and therefore they were given simpler lessons, they got dumb tracked or something like that. That would show up as a genetically heritable 
um, difference in intelligence between brow-ridged people and non-brow-ridged people. It does not mean that it is encoded in the genome and that it was the brain that was blueprinted. What it means is that some feature that was encoded in the genome caused the environment to interact with the individual in a way that then produced a difference in intellect. So there's, there's great danger. I think if there are, if we take heritable to mean what we think it does, the common parlance, the Darwinian version of heritable, the fact that there are any heritable differences that exist within a population guarantees there will be some differences between populations on average. It doesn't guarantee that they are sizable enough to be easily measured. It doesn't say that they have anything to do with inequities that we see in civilization. Um, but uh, just mathematically speaking, the idea that it would be zero is incredibly improbable. But it also, we also don't know which populations would be ahead. And the, what we tend to do is we tend to assume that inequities must be partially explained by these differences. And really, I think what Heather and I are both saying is that it is so early in the study of this stuff, we really don't know. And the taboo nature of those questions is causing the, uh, it's causing a vacuum that is being filled with an artificially pure and probably not correct perspective. Okay, that, so that question, we gave a very detailed answer because you're right, it was a, a, a minefield of where you don't want to answer that question. Okay, cool. So what I would like to do now, we have, what time are we have here? 7.31. So I would like to do rapid fire questions. Is that okay with everybody? So again, there may be questions that we can't do that with, but we will do our we best can. to do mi you. minefield questions. So thank you. Hello, could you tell us your name, please? Uh, my name is Alice. Hi, Alice. Um, so I'm trying to figure out what the fallacy is, or many fallacies are, in if everything is a social construct, as they claim, and it's all made up in this post-modernist world, but on the same token, it matters more than anything and everything beyond our character, mind, and reason with groups like BLM or Me Too, then why do the social constructs matter? Like, why does it matter? If, if they're made up, if they're not, not real, why do they? Why well, do they'll they say that they they were culturally invented, but they are uh, propped up and held in place by society because of um, you know prejudice and structural inequalities, and structural inequalities and inherited attitudes and so forth. But if you come with with men and women, um, you know it just seems to me, and I suppose everyone on the panel would agree that um, it it. it the idea that it's just socially constructed, if that were the case, you might suspect somewhere in the anthropological record you would find a society where the females were the warriors and the males were, you know, sort of standoffish and coy and more hesitant about sex. And the, the you know, nope. the males. <laughs> <laughs> and or, or you have, we just haven't seen them. And you would think that if it were simply cultural, you would find a society where you know the, the the women had the mathematical aptitudes highest and the males had the best verbal skills and so we haven't seen them so you begin to suspect that it's a combination but uh, you I mean it is a combination <laughs> but if I can remind you of what I said at the beginning the fact that something is cultural doesn't free us from the idea that it is a product of adaptive evolution. So right. even to the extent that these things happen to be transmitted culturally, it, I mean, this is really what you're getting at. There's a reason. Even if gender roles were transmitted 95% culturally, it would not say that they were distributed in an arbitrary fashion, which is pe what people like to infer from that belief. So really, I, I think the conclusion that is inescapable is that we have to look at these things. Some part of what we look at may make us uncomfortable, but the route to actually um, controlling our future involves not being dishonest about our past. That was awesome. <laughs> All right. Hello. Could you tell us your name, please? Uh, yeah, my name is Dan. Hi, Dan. Thanks um, for coming. It seems like in school, you know, you teach kids, you know, with diversity and sensitivity training to be nice to other people and to, and to identify, you know, when they're misbehaving and not do that. But it seems that at the same time, you're teaching them to be hypersensitive to those same issues. So the more you try to correct the problem, the more it seems that you're programming these people to suffer from that problem. 
And it's like, I notice if you go around Portland, if anyone you know, looks at any of the stores here, you'll notice like half the stores have these signs that say that they welcome people of all creed, all races. And then you'll see next to it a, a store that doesn't have that sign. And so then it makes, you know, if you were like a space alien that dropped into Portland, you would think that maybe half the stores in Portland were completely racist and that the, and that the other half weren't. And so it seems like, you know, the more we try to correct this problem, the more we're causing this problem. And so through the virtue signaling and all the training that we're giving to kids, you know, how do you prevent that feedback loop? And maybe that's the problem that we're in. Is this? And, and I'll just add to it that I, I find very interesting what's happening on campus and uh, is that you get these radical groups and they're complaining that they have been objectified and demonized and otherized and then they turn around and do it to someone else who you know they, they in other words they're doing to people exactly what they accused is done to them and that's when you asked us what what would be a sign that things were getting better is if people stopped doing that if you didn't have this this culture of recrimination and so in this quest for hypersensitivity, we have bullying and meanness, you know, done in the name of sensitivity. So people say, well, they're sensitivity fascists or something. And, I mean, it's ridiculous, but there are sensitivity fascists. Heather? We, we need to start letting children get hurt physically and emotionally and intellectually. <laughs> but treating them like they're fragile... Don't quote that fragile. on Twitter, anyone. <laughs> I, yeah, it's, it's a dangerous soundbite, but I mean, it's, ex it's exactly what you're pointing out. We treat people like they're fragile, and voila, they're fragile. And then we act surprised. Why are we surprised? Of course they're fragile. We've never let them get hurt and find out that actually bleeding or having your feelings hurt or... Being anti-fragile, like you're... Or being you're, told you, that if you're actually not you're wrong. You know what? You know, being told in the classroom, bad idea. Not all questions are good. And not all ideas, all ideas are good. And sometimes you're just wrong. And now you're going to learn. Better to hear that when you're 5 and 10 and 15 than wait until you're 25. And then this is what we have. And, and most of the times, it, it doesn't hurt that bad in the first place. So exactly right. I, I just want to add something to that. I, I think that I've never really seen the point in being nice. I, I think that... <laughs> Is this Twitter meme wars now, baby? Right, right. <laughs> See, I, I think what we need to teach people is to be kind. Niceness is such an insipid word. All right, thank you. Can you tell us your name, please? Hi, I'm Kirsten. Uh, I came up with this question after listening to the podcast on Joe Rogan, um, just talking about evolution and how... Um, for example, you use the lizards crossing over to an island and changing, uh, adapting evolutionarily. Um, is Do you ever think about how that could be a part of what's going on with the human race? Or this culturally, if it's biological, is this sort of a signal of what might be happening biologically with men and women changing biologically? So... Um, we, we are changing. We are, we are more cultural than any other organism out there, although there are plenty of other organisms with culture. Dolphins, elephants, wolves, parrots, crows, just to name a few. Right? Um, with regard to the monitor lizards who um, can become asexual when they go to islands and reproduce on their own without, without a male, um, we're not going to pull that off. <laughs> <laughs> Nor, nor do I want to, anyway. Um, I'm not, I'm not interested in In that. laboratories? Um, we couldn't do it in laboratories? Don't we? Oh, boy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to go there. Okay. Um, we have, because we have um, genetic sex determination, and it's not as simple as we think it is, but it's much more simple a kind of sex determination, um, it, is, uh, it is necessary for us as, as mammals um, and as it is necessary for birds, who also have a separate evolution of genetic sex determination, uh, to have both egg and sperm meet in order to have, have a baby. Um, so, boy, I'm not sure. Yeah, uh, actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drop the Komodo dragons, and I want to take a, a different uh, tack. So human beings are an incredibly unusual product of evolution. We're very weird. And a lot of what's weird about us has to do with the amount 
that has been offloaded to the cultural layer that's been taken away from the genome. The reason uh, is that that cultural layer can adapt much more rapidly. So our niche really is change. That's what we're good at. Now the problem that we face is that the change that is taking place now is so rapid that selection can't keep up with it. So we're not doing a good job, even though this is our specialty, because we've turned the speed up so fast, we just can't, we can't keep up. So uh, if there was something to be done, we would want to slow down the rate of change. It doesn't have to be really slow. It just has to be slow enough that we can pick up the patterns, figure out what responses make sense, and move in a, in a proper direction, rather than move in a chaotic direction based on the fact that you don't even live in the same environment that you grew up in. That's way too fast for us to deal with that, that level of change. All right, thank you for your question. Hi, can you tell us your name, please? Hi, uh, I'm Kaneo, and I have two questions, if that's well, all right. Welcome. Sure, yeah, two, shoot. Um, my first, my questions are related to the Demore issue you brought up about <laughs> Google. Um, I'm a musician. Brett brought that up. Uh, Brett, yeah. yeah. Um, I'm a musician, and I consider copyright to be one of the greatest threats on free speech. And along the lines with how it can be used to silence musical expression and artistic expression. And my question is about how corporations like Google employing copyright and becoming more political, how that could have a chilling effect, what you would think about that. I'm not, are we qualified to talk about that? I would recommend though Larry Lessig's code Larry Lessig's work and and his work on code, I, and it's really funny. Like you know, I have I don't know. Do you feel I have no problem criticizing this institution, any institution, gods? I'm terrified of criticizing Google. Now, there, there, there's a limit to what God can do. Yeah. Believe, but so no. we love Google. <laughs> Next question. Thank you. Sorry, that's just not our shtick. Oh yeah, you have two questions. My second question is about considering private corporations are very reliant and contingent on government being legal constructs and using subsidies and lobbying and bailouts, bailouts etc. Should they really be exempt from respecting free speech as much as, say, a private individual? What do you mean by respecting? Like... Well, he means like Google not allowing... DeMore to have his point of view, that kind of yeah, thing? Yeah, things like that. Um, yeah. I, I think this is quite clear, actually, that the founders, the founding fathers, did not anticipate a Google-like phenomenon. And so they gave us a constitution that addressed the things that they had seen, and the greatest threats to free speech are no longer governmental. So, yes, we need to figure out how to take the concept of freedom of expression, which is a, a value that probably everybody in this room holds dear, and to globalize it so that it, co you know, so that it doesn't distinguish, for example, between state schools and private schools or between Google and the federal government. It is important that whatever channels are necessary to be able to convey information are equally open, and how we do that when the Constitution is very narrow in what it protects is a, a question that we have to address. Okay, good, thank you. Thanks. Appreciate your questions. Hello, could you tell us your name, please? Yes, um, my name is uh, Armand, uh, and thank you again uh, for everybody coming here today. Well, thanks, Armand, yeah. appreciate that. Um, so my question, oh, hello. My uh, question here today is, uh, I appreciate your point you brought up about uh, the physical world and computers and virtualizations kind of splitting uh, reality physical world reality and what I would prefer as my specific reality. We are seeing niches like Google, um, you know. No more Google talk after this, yeah, that's yeah, yeah. moratorium. Um, my question is, uh, I see a lot of conversations brought up, a lot of very good uh, discussions, debates. Where did we miss the, the mark on that? And where did we kind of blow past talking about these very important points that I think that a lot of us objectively agree on, and how did we blow past that? And back to, just want to tie in the virtualization real quickly. Uh, 
I think that uh, we like to specify things, like, well, computer science love to make all these new categories of things like that, and we use uh, words and metaphors as our tools to um, navigate our virtual world. And so what's your question? Because I'm starting to drift. How are those metaphors, how are our tools of words being changed? Uh, and is that essentially kind of how we've blown past talk, seriously talking about these serious topics and more into uh, these topics of victimhood? Or do you think that victimhood is the, actually what we're getting down to? That's all. Um, I would argue that all species are inevitably built to compete, and that virtually everything that you could name about human beings is a mechanism that facilitates competition, whether it's your eyes that allow you to see better than some competitor for food, or your tendency to cooperate with other individuals against some third group. So what we are seeing are ancient mechanisms that are being triggered, I think, by austerity, actually, or the threat of austerity, and this is a totally predictable outcome that is resulting in a breakdown in the rationality of discussion. But what we don't anticipate is that rationality is, in general, a means to an end. We compete rationally when rational competition is advantageous, when rational competition is no longer as successful as ganging up on people, mobbing them, witch hunting them, whatever, we do that instead. So if we were uh, smart, we would recognize that all of those things that everybody in the room would rationally agree are bad human properties, the tendency to, to gang up and make warfare and commit genocide and all those things. If we really don't want those things to continue, the way to deal with it is to understand what they are and to go about systematically unhooking those things, to stop triggering them rather than um, be surprised when they reemerge, which they inevitably do. All right, we have time. Did you want to jump in? We have, yes, sir, let's go fast. Yeah, we have time for, for where's my man here? Where's Philip? We have, I think we have time for, for one, one more. But before your question, I just want to say a few things. Uh, this has been a, a really fantastic audience, and we appreciate very much the fact that, that you have engaged us. We have had a talk. We, it sounds silly to say, but that we haven't been disrupted or that we haven't been, but in this climate and especially today with, with hap, what happened to Christina, it really does speak to Portland State University and the culture we've built here. And thank you to everybody tonight very much. All right, all right there, son. Uh, my name is Arya, thanks for coming out. Um, so my question is uh, concerning this idea of um, subjectivity and relativism. And it sort of pertains to um, our Constitution. Um, we've had movements in the past to address um, human rights violations, and the way we addressed those was through looking at it through the prism of the Constitution. For example, we got the 13th Amendment because of the abolitionist movement, which got rid of slavery. Um, I was doing a little reading before I came here about second wave feminism and the um, the idea of an equal rights amendment to the Constitution. I was I actually appreciated that because they were trying to work within our constitutional uh, framework. So um, it seems to be that from the New Deal era all the way up until now, we have this really really toxic idea of the living Constitution that it means whatever we dream up at the moment. Right, so circumstances change in society, but following that cumbersome amendment process is not necessary for the sake of political expediency. Okay, so what's your question? So, so my question is: um, Is this crisis of relativism and victimhood? Is this because we've given up on the idea that things have meaning, including words, like words in a constitution? Well, in terms of free speech um, and, and due process, like for example, what's being done in the name of Title IX and these often kangaroo courts on campus, um, if these reach the Supreme Court, it, it's going to be, um, it, it will save us. And I think the votes in favor of free speech typically on that court, it's almost, you know, you, close to unanimous. 
So uh, from the college campus, historically, the court has been, in, in, in certainly in the last 30 years, constantly in favor of more and more freedom and due process, absolutely. So right now, the Constitution is, is working. It just, the, a lot of the crazy things we've been talking about, they just haven't worked their way there yet. But if they do, I think it's still our best friend. <laughs> and, you know, now, will that change? Will people be coming out of law schools with some, you know, uh, I don't know, uh, postmodern theory of freedom? Which, yeah. Well, no, Ruth Bader Ginsburg would, would come down in favor of free speech, and she said she thought there was a lack of due process on campus. I mean, she she's okay. But I'm worried about people that might, the law students I met today, some of them, no, most of them were fine. But if they end up, you know, moving through that, that's, it's, it's, it's just up to this generation. You know, every generation faces a challenge to freedom, and, and you know, we saw outbreaks of, intolerance with the McCarthy era, and there, there, was, there were different scares and moral panics, they come and go. But so far, uh, I think we have reason to be optimistic, and we may have, you know, just have invented a very good system. And I would suggest also reading Steve Pinker's new book on the Enlightenment. Enlightenment Now. Enlightenment Now. And he's very optimistic and is kind of reminding all of us of how much progress we've made. And how optimistic um, we should Matt be. Matt Ridley has some great work. Matt Ridley. And Michael Shermer has some great work about, yes. right. And, uh, but I think all of them would credit a lot of it to Enlightenment values, to the American constitutional system. And so I'm still confident that it's going to work and optimistic. Mm -hmm. It has so far. Uh, it, it has so far. I'm really not optimistic, and I, <laughs> so I, I think I think this is an important um, difference of opinion. And I would argue that it's time to abstract the values on which our system is based, which are excellent values, imperfect but excellent, from the structure, which I would argue is almost totally inadequate for our modern circumstance. And it's time to rescue those values and figure out what structure can actually support them in the modern. Yeah, I, I want to piggyback on that because you said a few times tonight, I think you said fairness and you mentioned a few things, and I think that, I'm not, not a big fan of speaking for other people, but I think that we all believe here that the values we hold are rationally drivable. Justice, you know, what, fairness from John Rawls. And that's no small thing. Right? That's one of the reasons we engage in discourse. That's one of the reasons we have a dialogue. That's one of the reasons we have discussions. These values aren't arbitrary values. The values that have come from us through the Enlightenment, the values of freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of assembly, I don't know about the Second Amendment, I won't go there, but uh, the, the, process. the due process, the values that we have and that we share, I believe that they're rationally drivable. And so when that's more reason to have a conversation, not less reason. Because if you can be wrong about those values, you don't want to institutionalize the wrong values. All right, thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Appreciate, appreciate it tonight.